Good morning. Oh, thanks for Hello. being here. We're going to give the rest of the attendees a minute or two to show up and then we'll get started. Yep, ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to talk about sizing up some battery banks today. Battery stuff is like my favorite thing to talk about. So I'm really excited to have a little bit of time to talk with some folks about it. It's gonna be good. Well, let's do it. Um, my name is Jeff Hawes. I'm the vice president of sales for Go Green Solar. Um, I've been in solar for 16 years. I'm a true believer in renewables with an electric car and uh, really appreciate the solar industry. And um, Grow Green Solar is um, a business that serves people who want to install solar on a do-it-yourself basis and save a lot of money doing so. Typically, the you know the labor part of a solar project, it can be anything from 45 to 60 percent of the cost. So you can really save a lot of money installing on your own. And our role is to help our customers design a system that fits their needs and then uh, ship them the system. But in the process, we create a custom installation guide. There are similar companies who just give you an installation manual, but we create a custom guide that is specific to the system that we designed with you and to your home so that when you when it's time to install you have something that will really work for you we also offer um, a plan set service where we draw plans that you use to get your permit we have an interconnection service uh, in some jurisdictions you will need engineering stamps on your plans we we offer that service and then we support you through the installation so we're we're really dedicated not just to solar but to helping people succeed in do-it-yourself installations and uh the the man next to me has done so much through the years to help people uh be successful in their in their diy solar i'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and friend schwa rice hi thanks jeff i'm schwa I've been in the solar industry for a little over 12 years, coming up on 13 years. I don't know how it got to be such a long amount of time. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. I've spent a lot of time doing technical support and technical design work. I work on our um, plan sets. I do some drafting, that kind of thing. My specialty's always kind of been battery chemistry and off-grid living. So I'm I'm a little bit of a battery nut. So I was I was really excited and grateful to be able to have some time to go over uh, some battery stuff with you all. And I thought that if we got in and looked a little bit at um, lithium batteries, kind of lithium versus lead acid batteries, how batteries are growing in the industry, and um, some stuff on how to size up a system. I put together a couple examples in this slide deck on how to size up a battery bank uh, for a partial home backup, and then what it would look like if you wanted to do whole home backup. And then there's a little bit of explanation in there as well on how to quantify how much power is in batteries and, and that kind of thing. So really excited. And we'll go ahead and start into this slide deck. Let's see here, pop over here. Okay, so like I was saying, energy storage is on the rise. Batteries are starting to get more and more popular and not just for off-grid living anymore either. The uh, inclusion of batteries in grid tie systems for the purpose of backup power and some other functions has just grown exponentially. You know, over the last, particularly like the last five years or so, there's been a huge surge in it. And some of the things that we can look at for having batteries in a grid tied system or a grid interactive system are going to be A, when the power goes out, you've got some stored power. You know, how much stored power, that's something that we're going to kind of talk about today. But the idea is that you want to be able to keep your food in your fridge cold 
you know, you want to be able to keep your devices charged up so you can communicate. You know, you want to be able to have some lights on, that kind of thing. Everybody's priorities are a little bit different, but having backup power is an amazing, an amazing thing that a lot of people are looking to, uh, especially when you're in a place where you can't just run a noisy generator. You know, you may not be able to run out and get fuel refills if the grid's down for a prolonged period of time, that kind of thing. The other thing I have down here, uh, the next thing, demand charges, right? If you have a power company that's going to come in and say, hey, if you are using more than 15 kilowatts of power at a time, we're going to charge you twice as much. Maybe you pay 15 cents a kilowatt uh, hour, and if you're using more than a given amount it's like 30 cents a kilowatt hour you could use a battery based system to get in and shave off uh, the the upper part you could say if you've got a battery bank set up you could be pulling you know 9,000 watts from the grid and you could be you know pulling the other five six thousand watts from batteries keep yourself from being charged more and the same is true for time of use rates. That's where the power company comes in and says, well, power is more expensive from 4 p.m. until 10 p.m. That's when everybody wants to use power. And you get in, well, I don't want to pay twice as much just because I'm using power to cook dinner and take a shower when I get home kind of thing. You can use batteries to get in and power loads during those critical times so that you're not using grid power when they're charging a premium for it. So a lot of different reasons to get in and have battery uh, backup or batteries just integrated into your grid tied system. When you get in and you start looking at some of the trends and charts, I'm not a huge chart person, you know, I'm, I'm more of a using tools and, and working outside kind of guy, but you know, the data doesn't lie. You know, this is from the Department of Energy. If you get in and are looking at how many people are using batteries in their grid tied systems, it's coming up. Look at in 2018 versus 2022. I mean, the way the graph is set up, it doesn't look like an astronomical jump, but in reality it is because we're talking gigawatt hours here. This is this is a lot. This is a lot of power that we're talking about. A lot of people looking at batteries. And the more the power companies kind of start to feel the the squeeze of everybody using renewable energy, the more they want to have folks who have got battery based um, grid tied systems that can kind of shave off those peak loads and and be able to support themselves when there's when there's issues like rolling blackouts, things like that. So there's a lot of benefits to it now. When we get in and are looking at batteries, there's a couple different technologies. There's actually several different technologies, but the, the gold standard at this point is lithium or lead acid, right? Lead acid has been our go-to for since I started like 13 years ago, lead acid was about all there was. You know, lead acid is quite large in terms of its footprint you know um it is quite a bit less expensive you know but heavier and larger a little more difficult to deal with as far as placing a battery bank you know having to do maintenance on your battery bank and that kind of thing you sort of have to babysit a lead acid battery quite a bit more because it doesn't have an integrated battery management system and they also are quite a bit less efficient Right, like a lead acid battery is going to run about 80% efficiency round trip. That means if you put 100% power into the battery, you can then pull 80% of that back out. And the, and the rest of it's kind of lost to inefficiency. But it's still quite a reliable technology. And lead acid batteries are like 99% recyclable. Um, most people's issue with lead acid is that they don't last as long. They don't have near the number of cycles that a lithium battery would. And so with a lithium battery, you're going to look at replacing them um, less frequently. You have a lot more stored power in lithium batteries as far as for the, you know, the size, the, the space that it takes up and the weight 
of the lithium batteries, you're going to have more power density than you would over lead acid. We got lighter, smaller. They are more expensive. You know, um, one of the great things about them is that they will all have built into them a battery management system. That's a, also called a BMS. And that is the brains of the operation that takes care of all of your batteries, right? That's part of what gives us our longer life expectancy and more cycles. The BMS is constantly looking at each bank of cells to see what the voltage is. It's constantly looking at the temperature all over the place to see, you know, where temperatures are at, seeing if the banks of cells are, are equalized and that kind of thing. So that's just a basic, you know, lead acid versus lithium. They're both still viable options with lithium is starting to pull ahead. There's also the idea of lithium versus lithium, right? Like not all lithium batteries are created equal. And when we're talking about doing renewable energy, we're talking specifically about lithium ferrous phosphate, the lithium iron. That's the safer of the technologies that um, is less likely to have issues like thermal runaway fires and that kind of thing. There was a bunch of issues with that years back and like, like Boeing was having issues with lithium batteries on planes and that kind of thing. So the, the lithium iron batteries, they're our gold standard for safety and they come in a couple different form factors, right? We have pouch cells, cylindrical cells, and prismatic cells. And we don't have to get too much into what the different cells, you know, do. They're all basically your same uh, lithium, you know, functionality. Your, your anode is going to be, uh, it's aluminum coated with the LIFPO4, and your cathode is going to be a copper foil that's coated with virgin graphite graphite that's never seen lithium before and in all three of these topologies that's what we have going on here you know they're jumping around through an electrolyte uh, it's an organic it's um, has a consistency of like gasoline kind of thing and so for our intents and purposes we're talking about fortress power that's one of the batteries that we're talking about and working with and the other is n phase and n phase makes the n charge batteries there's a three and a ten we'll look at those Fortress makes the E-Flex, which is smaller, and an E-Vault, which is a larger battery. And they all use prismatic cells because they've got the best durability, thermal stability, and overall longevity. Okay, so what in the heck is an amp hour, right? Like that's a, that's a big question. And when I started in this industry, I was so perplexed as to what an amp hour actually was and I must have had it explained to me a thousand times before I before I really got it, you know. Um, so an amp hour is just the amount of amperage, you know, that you can pull out of a battery in an hour. And we're never going to pull our entire battery capacity in an hour. That's sort of silly, you know. But that's the way that they want to get in and look at what an amp hour is. Uh, so. What we want to do is if you're looking at batteries and they're rated in amp hours, a lot of the time you'll find that there is a one hour rate, a five hour rate, 10 hour rate, 50, 100 hour rate. They have all these statistics and charts on how much battery power you can pull over a given period of time measured in hours. And well, if you're, if you're looking there, the only thing we're interested in is the 20 hour rate. The 20 hour rate of batteries is the closest thing that we've got to what we're doing uh, in renewable energy uh, with solar in particular, you know, most of the time we're looking at peak sun, you know, how much peak sun you get in a given area. And it's, you know, between three and six hours of peak sun, depending on where you are and the time of year and that kind of thing. Uh, but in general, we can look at it and say, well, okay, so you have four hours of peak sun that you're charging batteries. And then the other 20 hours, we're discharging the batteries. And it may not be, you know, it's not an exact science there. You may have more than four hours and not discharging for quite 20. But as far as how they rate batteries, that's the closest that we can get in terms of, you know, what we're looking for. So the 20 hour rate is, is really what we're looking for. 
Now, so that still doesn't really explain to us how much usable power is in there. Like I'm talking about like in, in kilowatt hours or watt hours, like give me something I can use. How much power can I pull out of here and speak a language that I understand? You know, that's, I get that. And so we can use Ohm's law. Ohm's got several laws. The one that I want to focus on is watts equals amps times volts, right? And so we know that the battery bank is going to be a given voltage. You know, in the case of lithium, it's 51.2 volts is our nominal voltage that we want to work with. And then our amps, we're going to use our amp hour rating. We have a 20 hour rating on there and we'll get in and say, well, okay, if you multiply the battery bank voltage by the number of amp hours, then we're going to get a really solid idea for exactly how much power can be stored in that battery in, in watt hours or kilowatt hours. And that makes it a lot easier uh, than, than looking at amp hours, because when you go through and you figure out how much power you're using by looking at your power bill and that kind of thing, you're not going to you're not going to look at your power bill and say, oh, they billed me two hundred and fifty dollars for X number of amp hours of power. No, they're kilowatt hours of power. And so finding that common denominator seems to be the, the best way to go. And most of the lithium batteries are actually measured in kilowatt hours. And they'll have an expression there in amp hours, but it'll be rated in mostly in in kilowatt hours. So we have the benefit a lot of the time of just seeing how many kilowatt hours are in a battery in general. So let's let's look really quick at what a kilowatt is versus what a kilowatt hour is, because they're totally different. If you're getting in and you're looking at what a kilowatt is, you know, a kilowatt is that's a thousand watts. You're using a thousand watts, like at this particular instant in time, you turn on your blender and it uses a thousand watts. That's its real time draw. It's using a thousand watts right now. But then if we want to figure out how much power is being used over time, now we have to add in hours is, is how it's calculated out. So we're looking at how many kilowatts over how many hours, right? A blender is not a great example because you wouldn't usually run it for an hour. So that's that's a little bit silly. The same with a microwave. But for our intents and purposes, we could get in and say, if you run a thousand watt blender for one hour, then you've used 1000 watt hours or one kilowatt hour, right? I grabbed this little, um, this little image here to kind of give an idea of what the difference is between power and energy. So a kilowatt that you're using right now, that's power, right? If you're looking at a hose and you have a given amount of water coming out of the hose, that's power. We're not talking about how much water is being accumulated somewhere. We're just talking about how fast it's coming out of the pipe, right? Power is how fast the water is flowing. Now, if we want to take a look at you know how that stacks up over time now we're talking about energy now we're talking about kilowatt hours by adding in that time aspect to it right we've got this amount of water flow coming in and if we have this much water flow over time we will see this amount of total energy you know total water stored in the bucket water is coming out of the hose at this rate and then if you multiply that by X number of hours, here's how much total water you will have stored. And electricity will kind of work the same way. If you're if you're using power right now, you could be pulling 100 watts, you know, and if you're using 100 watts for 10 hours, you've used 1,000 watt hours or one kilowatt hour. So then we get in and we say, well, all right, cool. We know how many kilowatt hours are in the batteries, right? And we know the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. So what we need to do is get in and figure out how much power we actually need to quantify our actual needs to run our loads. And there's a couple different ways to do that. I think probably the easiest way to quantify your overall power usage is to just get your power bill. And if you take your power bill for a month and you divide it by 30, that's going to get you, you know, your 
how many kilowatt hours you use per day. Use a thousand kilowatt hour a month divided by 30. Okay, this is my daily usage in kilowatt hours. And it's keep in mind that's an average. You know, some days you may be using more than others, almost guaranteed. You know, but that gives you a good solid average and a you know a baseline for knowing how much power is being consumed at your place. You you can then get in and start looking at specific things, right? Like your your refrigerator your freezer your you know things like that where you're like well if the power goes out i know i need this to stay on you know maybe the pool pump turns off and maybe your you know neon sign in your man cave or whatever turns off you know those things that are not critical we may end up ruling those out and saying well we don't need to back these up you know but getting in and looking at what each thing uses will help you figure out how much stored power that you need to be able to keep those things running, you know, if the grid is down and stays down for, you know, a day or more. So the big thing to keep in mind here is that whatever your appliance is rated for in terms of wattage, that's how much power it consumes every hour. This is an example of a load evaluation form. And here we get in and are seeing a form that somebody's put together on their own. This is just, they. there's there's several forms that you could like print out or you could do it in an Excel spreadsheet. This one is just written down on a piece of paper, which I, I prefer to write things down on paper with a pen personally. But the idea is that we're taking what we need to, to stay powered and we're writing it all down. They've got CFL light bulbs, six of them. They use 11 watts, you know, so this is, what you're running, how much power it uses, and for how long. And the idea is when we get done, you know, with our form, we will say, well, all right, here we go. We need X number of kilowatt hours per day to run all of these things. You can see they've got their pump down there. That's only half horsepower. That's a pretty small pump. You know, um, all these things get factored in. And this will give us a watt hours per day or kilowatt hours per day that's specific to things we want to back up. And this is going to be a little different than just taking your power bill and dividing it by 30, because now we're going to get in and look at, you know, well, OK, not everything I own, but we'll get in and look at how we can back up, you know, X number of things and how much power it would actually take to do that. Well, could I add now, something here? Yes, please. Um, so there are a couple of our partners have nice online calculators uh, to help you with those kind of calculations that they, you indicate what kind of appliances you want to power and what your needs are. And then it spits out some recommendations for what your system could look like. Um, and you, Enphase, you mentioned Schwa, they have a calculator like that online. And um, attendees, you can print out You're a PDF. Right. You can print out a PDF of the um, results that you could send us and use as a basis for discussion. There's also our inverter partner, Solark, has a calculator. So I will post those in the group chat. I'll post the links if oh, any of the attendees want to copy them. That's all. Yes, you. you guys you guys should copy those things down. They are super useful and they'll keep you from having to start from scratch. They have like a setup where you can get in and you know, just put a checkbox, oh, fridge freezer. And then it's, you know, they have all of those numbers down. I talked with Jeff about it. I swore that I was gonna bring that up here. Um, thanks for being my backstop, buddy. I appreciate you. Those those two things, do check them out. He's gonna link them into the chat. Those are super useful, um, even to just give you an idea of, of where you wanna go with it. So, here, if we're looking at how to figure out specific wattage on a load, if you're using a load that wasn't already spelled out on one of those forms, you know, they've got a lot on them, but there's a couple things they don't have. But one thing that we that we know is that if you get in and are looking at an electrical appliance, you know, be it a lamp or a blender or a microwave or whatever, it's gonna have, it's gonna have one of these one of these spec sheets on it or a spec plate or a, you know a sticker or a stamp that tells you how much power that it's using right and there's a bunch of stuff on here we don't really need to know about 
we could see it's UL listed. That's cool. We know that it's safe and that everybody has agreed that it's safe to use kind of thing. But the main thing we're looking at here is the volts and the amps, because we know that watts is amps times volts. That's that Ohm's law thing we were talking about earlier, trying to figure out how much is in a battery. Well, we can do the same thing to figure out how much a load is going to consume. You know, this is, they put 110 to 127 volts AC, but we know this is just the regular 120 volts AC, you know, that you would get out of a wall, your standard AC power for a lamp or a blender, or, a, you know, if you plug into an outlet, that's 120 volts AC. If you screw a light bulb into a socket, that's 120 volts AC. And in this case, we can see 11.6 amps is how much it's drawing. So we would get in and say, well, okay, here 120 volts times 11.6 amps. That's gonna tell us how much wattage that pulls in an hour, right? And then we can get in and look at, well, okay, how many hours out of the day is your refrigerator actually going to be running? You know, and I think the average is like four hours. It depends on the temperature. You know, if your fridge is in a garage and it's 120 degrees in the garage in the middle of summer, your fridge is gonna, it's gonna cycle more. It's going to be running more than if the fridge is in the garage and the garage is 40 degrees and it's in the middle of the winter and your fridge hardly ever has to kick on. So there's, you know, a lot of factors there. But one other way that's a little easier and maybe not quite as accurate is to get in all appliances um, are going to have an energy guide. Maybe not little, little teeny things like a blender or, a, or something like that, but most of the bigger appliances will have one of these energy guides, right? The energy guide tells you how many kilowatt hours that appliance will consume in a year. So we could get in and just take that and divide it by 365, 365 days in a year. So if we got in on this example, 630 divided by 365, that's 1.72 kilowatt hours per day. So 1,720 watt hours per day is what this appliance would be consuming. Now, keep in mind, this, this is an example of a fridge. This is an example of a fridge. They're not the same fridge, you know, so um, they're not really to compare one versus the other, more just two different ways to look at it, you know. Amps times volts will tell us the wattage of this thing, or we could use one of these and say, well, okay, on average, it's going to use this much power per day. Okay. So we got a little bit of that under our belts. Let's look at what some of the options are as far as batteries go. I'd mentioned Fortress and Enphase, and those are the ones that I'm gonna kind of focus on here. So Fortress, they're lithium ferrous phosphate, that's lithium iron. They're using the safest battery technology, you know, with the prismatic cells, both Fortress and Enphase. And so here on the Fortress side, they have the E-Flex, that's, that's their smaller battery and it was designed to fit into a server rack uh, i don't know if you guys are familiar with a server rack uh, most people don't you know host a website and that kind of thing but for folks that do you will see server racks that have all kinds of cat5 cables and communication cables and servers and things stacked in these shelves and so these batteries were meant to stack in those kinds of server racks and it makes them really easy to integrate into a lot of different situations. They come with wall mount brackets for mounting them on the wall. You know, they're pretty versatile as far as, far as uh, where you can put them. And they're relatively, they're relatively light. You know, you can, you can heave them around and they're not crazy heavy to where you have to have multiple people to be moving them around. Although truth be told, when I I was hoisting them by myself onto the server rack. I kind of wish that I had someone else there, <laughs> especially after the second or third when they start to feel heavier and heavier. And then they've got the E Vault. So this is their larger freestanding battery. And it kind of looks like a, I don't know, like a trash compactor or something like that. And um, boy, that represents a lot of stored power. The E Flex, that's got. 5,400 watt hours in it that we can use versus the E Vault is about three times that amount of power, 18,500 watt hours, right? The big thing we want to keep in mind with lithium batteries is that you're not able to discharge 
more than 90% of what's in them. You can't use them until they're completely drained and are at 0%. It's really bad for them. You know, this is in contrast with a lead acid battery where you can use 50% of what's in there. You know, so the lithium allows you to use more of the stored capacity in there uh, than a lead acid does by using up to 90% of what's in there. Frankly, between between me and you guys, it's between 80 and 90% that you're able to pull out of these batteries. I am always telling people 80%. Use 80% of what's in your lithium battery. You'll get more cycles out of them. You'll get more total throughput out of them. You know, it's like the engineers who are putting together the battery say, oh, well, ideally you won't pull more than 80% out of here. You could go 90, but you, you won't get quite as, as much life out of them. You won't get quite as much um, throughput, they call it. They're not really looking so much at cycles as what's the total amount of power that you put through these batteries? How much power has gone into and come back out of these batteries? The battery management system is always tracking that, so we always know. So I think the marketing teams for lithium batteries kind of went with, well, we want to advertise as much as you can. You know, technically you can pull 90% out of them, you know, but I always say 80 because I'm always trying to be conservative and make things last as long as I can. So we've got, you know, 4.8 kWh we can pull out of the E-Flex, 16.6 kWh that we can pull out of the E-Vault. And Enphase has similar offerings. They've got the N-Charge 3. This is, this is 3.5 kWh, 3,500 watt hours of which we've got 3.36 of them are usable. So I'm pretty sure Enphase is also using this, the 90%, you could use 90% of what's in these batteries. I personally wouldn't pull more than 80% out of them, um, but that's what they're, what they're rated for. Their N-Charge 10 is considerably larger, you know, uh, 10 kilowatts that you can pull out of it. So the N-Charge 3 and the N-Charge 10 are, are named to where it's easy. We don't have to remember anything. You got three kilowatt hours in the three, you got 10 kilowatt hours in the 10. And interestingly enough, this, this skinny thing here, this is the three, and this one down here is the 10. The 10 is actually three of the threes all put together inside of there with one cover over the top. The more we start talking about including batteries and grid tied systems, the more we kind of have to go to battle with knowing where to put them. And there's quite a few considerations on where the batteries will go. You know, batteries are expensive, so everybody wants to put them, you know, somewhere really safe. Um, but the fact is you can mount these batteries outside. They're rated to be outdoors. and um, the thing we have to keep in mind is that temperature is going to play a big, a big role here as far as the amount of power that you know you can pull out of them. Lead acid batteries, as they get cold, their capacity goes down considerably. And the big thing with lithium batteries is if they're below freezing, they don't work like at all. So we got to make sure that we're putting lithium batteries somewhere where they're never going to get below freezing, and and so that kind of falls into, well, all right, you could put them in your garage, you could put them in your house somewhere, you know, but you have to do so safely, right? Like you can't just put batteries in your garage and call it a day. You know, what if somebody knocks a metal leaf rake into them and it shorts the terminals out? What if, what if, you know, somebody comes in and trips and falls onto it? You know, I've got the example here uh, shows bollards. And the bollards are, you know, like something you would see in a parking lot that keeps you from smashing your car into a light pole. The more people start putting batteries in their garage, the more the codes start to change to address that kind of thing. And we're starting to see now that impact protection and things to keep um, people away from the terminals and conductors and stuff, the batteries, that's starting to get to be the standard. You have to do that now. You know, in the past, it was kind of like, well, yeah, there's not a whole lot of code that's really specific to what the batteries 
you know, are doing in the garage. It's just kind of, if they're lead acid, they have to be vented and we don't know anything about lithium, but we've come a long ways now. So we're starting to see these kind of protections come in, not just for solar batteries. You see it for this example here. I believe this is a forklift battery charger. And you're starting to see this kind of thing for hot water heaters in that as well. Uh, up here, I, we've got an example of this is a heat sensor. In California, it's getting to be particularly difficult to put your lithium batteries in your garage because they are starting to adopt uh, a newer code requirement that says that your lithium batteries need to be integrated with a heat detection system where if you get above a certain temperature, it's going to automatically open circuit your batteries and shut them down. There's not, there's not a great, there's not a great solution to this yet though, you guys. It's, it's kind of one of these cases where they get in and they make the rule that they want to have, and then they wait for somebody to innovate something that fits the need, right? So putting batteries in your garage in California is, is a little bit more difficult than it is in most other places, but you know, the lithium manufacturers are working hard with the, the folks who make the thermal sensors to, to get the show on the road. All right, let's get in and look at an example of doing partial home backup. Now I'm trying to just stick with the basics on this one. And I always, I always say lights and outlets, fridge and freezer. That's just like my standard response. Those are the things that we wanna get in and back up. You know, there may be more to it than that, but this is kind of like the gold standard. This is the baseline. This keeping your food cold, keeping you from bumping into things because you could turn on the lights and you could plug in your tablet, your cell phone, your radio, whatever, you know, to make sure you're in communication with the people that you care about and that you know what's going on in the world. So here we've got some examples, you know, 30 watts worth of lighting for six hours, 100 watts worth of outlets for six hours, and then we've got a fridge freezer. We'll plan on it kicking on and off being on for a total of about five hours. So that gives us 5,280 watt hours or 5.28 kilowatt hours, right? same thing. And that's how much we need daily to run these things. So the 5.37 kilowatt hour, that's what's in a single E-Flex. Right, we can use 80 or 90 percent of what's in there. You can see I've already switched over to pulling only 80 percent out of this battery. You can technically pull 90. So, if we need 5.28 per day, and we've got um, 4.3 to 5 in a single E flex, then theoretically we could say, Well, yeah, one, one actually ought to cover you. Maybe you could cut down the lighting time by an hour you know, or, or that kind of thing. This is where it gets a little bit kludgy because um, you're not always gonna have ideal building blocks. You know, there's not, there's not half and quarter size batteries where you could say, well, I just need this and a little bit more. You know, you kind of need to get in and say, well, look, if you need more than one E-Flex worth of battery, then you need two. You could go from one to two, but there's not, there's not any stepping stones in between there. So that's kind of a tricky spot where you get in and you say, well, is one gonna be enough? Well, that depends, you know, two would probably be overkill, you know, if you were just looking at bare bones, but most of the battery based inverters are gonna require that you have at least two of these anyway. And so by getting in and looking this here, these are the specs for the E-Flex and we can get in and say, well, all right, cool. This is the 5.374, we need 5.28. Seems like it lines up great, but then we remember we can't pull 100% out of this battery, 80%, maybe 90%, you know. Um, on the 80, 90% thing, I'm so used to people living off grid, right? If you live off grid, then, then you don't wanna be pulling 90% out of your batteries every single day, right? If you're off grid, you're cycling your batteries every day. That's what you do. You know, if your grid tie with battery backup, it may be the case that, you know, the power doesn't go out that often, five or six times a year, right? If you're only cycling your batteries five or six times a year, then the 90% number makes a lot more sense. And so I guess I'm just trying to be conservative on the amount of power here. But if you're, if you're doing grid tie battery backup, you could pull 90% out of there. And I'm pretty sure that one E-Flex battery would have the amount of power in it that you would need. 
Um, on the end charge three, we're not quite there, right? Each one of those is three kW h kilowatt hours that we can pull out of there. So we'd need two of those, and that would put us at uh, six kilowatt hours of usable capacity, just a little bit more than that. You know, so one or two of the E-flexes, two of the N-charge threes, that's gonna get in and cover us as far as lights and outlets, bridge and freezer. Here's an example of a solar arc with a couple of E-flexes. So if we, if we jump over and are looking at whole home backup, now we're gonna start adding in more stuff and this can get complex really quick to try to keep things somewhat simple. I've added in just a couple of extra things here, some heavy hitters. Here's our same lights and outlets and fridge and freezer, but now I wanna add in an electric hot water heater, right? This is a heavy hitter. This is so 4,000 watts per hour. If you've got a total of four hours on your hot water heater, 16 kilowatt hours it adds in a lot like that's you know more than double what we were looking at for just those other things dishwasher you know 300 watts for three hours that's like one cycle if you're using the heat dry i would say that you know this isn't a great thing to back up probably but for the sake of discussion you know we're going to add in some loads in here and say well i want to have all my stuff running i don't want to feel like i have to you know run around and be turning everything off and, and figuring things out so for our example we got the hot water heater the dishwasher and we've added in an air conditioner air conditioners getting to be less and less of a luxury and more and more of a necessity you know we want to have our air conditioner going you know so if we get in here we've got 31 kilowatt hour per day that we need and so adding in adding in these other appliances has added in a lot uh, of extra power that we need to have stored so that we can, you know, keep all these things running. And then just to point it out, I put the, pointed out this other impact bollard here. They're starting to call for these for uh, hot water heaters as well. You know, this, this keeps your teenager from crashing, you know, your Tesla into your, into your batteries or your hot water heater, that kind of thing. So, Let's break down the whole home backup thing. This is 31 kilowatt hour of power that we need per day to run what's in here. Remember, we can only use 80% of what's in a lithium battery. Technically it's 90, but we're trying to, we're trying to take as best care of these batteries as we can. So if we look at our E-Flex, here we've got 4.3 kWh each. Right, so we do some quick math. See, well, we need 31 divided by 4.3, I could pull out of it, and you need seven. Just a little over seven. That's that same thing where it's kind of like, yeah, it doesn't hit the nail on the head. You're best to round up and have more power available than to round down, you know. Um, but there's there's a lot that goes into it, you know, trying to plan out exactly how much power you're going to use versus what happens in reality, you know, kind of couple different things there. And there's also the idea that when it's sunny outside and you're producing power from solar uh, and the grid is down, of course, you're not gonna be using power out of your batteries as long as you're producing power from solar enough to run it, right? Like if you've got your air conditioner running and you're using your dishwasher and you're doing you know, 3000 watts worth of loads, if you're bringing in 5000 watts from solar panels, then you're not discharging your batteries, right? Panels are making 5,000 watts, you're using 3,000 watts. That means there's 2,000 watts left over to charge batteries kind of thing. So making hay while the sun shines is what I always call that. You know, if you run your air conditioner during the day while the sun is out, well, you're not gonna be discharging your batteries as long as you're making that 1,200 watts or whatever from solar. So be cooling your house off all day long with solar, you know, running your air conditioner direct and not discharging your batteries. You know, if you wait until it gets dark and then you turn on your air conditioner and try to start cooling everything down, that's just pure batteries, baby. That's just gonna start hammering on your batteries and, you know, it won't take long to drain them down. Versus if you, if you have your air conditioner running all day, trying to cool the place off, 
by the time the sun is not on the panels anymore, you're probably at a decent temperature, right? Now you don't have to use your battery bank power to cool the house off by that other seven, eight degrees, it'll already be cooled off. Okay, so if we're looking at the E-Vault, we do the same math in here. We say, well, we need 31 kilowatt hour a piece and we can get, you know, 14, 15 kilowatts out of each. So we need two, just, just over two, but two is likely to, to do the trick. Here's some examples. This is a solar converter, and these are the E-Flex set up here on uh, what looks to be a server rack setup that they've got mounted here. So four of the E-Flex versus this is two of the E-Vault with that same solar converter here. So similar amounts of power. Uh, the thing called for seven, I couldn't find one that was actually you know, exactly seven batteries. So for the sake of discussion, you know, there would be an extra three batteries over here, you know, to make up the total for seven that we were talking about. And then two of the e balls. Oops, lost one of my AirPods. I've been wanting to get some of those clips that go over your ears to hold these things in so I could go jogging or something. They're always falling out. All right. Okay, whole home backup within phase. If we get in here, we would be looking at three of the in charge tens, right? Each one of those has got 10 kilowatt hour that we can pull out of them. And so if we if we needed 30 of usable power, well, we'd need three. So here's these, these big N charge tens that N phase makes. Now, keep in mind when, when we're talking about the N charge batteries that N phase makes, we're always talking about um, having to add in some extra bits and pieces, you know, some extra gear that makes it work. There is a, it's called an IQ system controller two that's got their built-in transfer switch and all the bits and bobs you need to get to get the thing up and running. You know, in both cases, it's not just a matter of you only buy the batteries and then that's what you need. You know, there's, there's some extra bits and pieces. If we're talking about Fortress, then you need a battery-based inverter. If we're talking end phase, the inverters are actually built in. And I don't have any good graphics on it, but if you guys look up the N-Charge 10 or the N-Charge 3, you'll find inside of here, in this lower compartment, they've got all their lithium battery cells. And in this upper compartment, they've got a bank of their micro inverters in there. They're actually IQ8 plus BAT is their specific model. And they've got firmware in there for being able to move power both directions, take battery power, run loads, take AC power, charge batteries, so there's banks of micro inverters in here and they're all controlled by the brain. This IQ system controller, here's where we've got our um, IQ combiner with our Envoy. That's the like the communication bridge that talks to all the solar panels and, and um, does all your communication and that kind of stuff. So if we look at partial versus whole home backup pricing, because that's something that always, you know, that always ends up coming up. Well, how much does all this stuff cost? You know, a single E-Flex is 3850 and a single E-Vault is 11570 right? And so when we get in and are looking at what it's going to take, you know, our partial home backup example, I, I went with two of the E-Flex because while there's one, uh, one battery would get you the amount of stored power that you need, you're not going to be able to find an inverter that will work with just one battery, right? The inverter is going to need two. So there we're looking at two of the E-Flex. We're going to be at 7,700. And getting into the whole home backup example, seven of the E-Flex is going to be just under 27,000 or two of the E-Vault at just over 23,000. And in this case, I would say the E-Vault, you know, is a couple thousand dollars less expensive and there's only two batteries to deal with, right? Versus having to mount and wire 
and and do the communication and everything for seven of those e-flex which isn't that big of a pain in the butt you know but i think working with two batteries is probably a lot more easy than working with seven when it comes down to actually having to put in the man hours to install them so we can we can also see that adding in the hot water heater and the dishwasher and the air conditioner drove the price up quite a bit and this is what i find with folks uh, who are like well yeah i want to back up everything in my house and then we get in and we crunch some numbers and they go all right well i changed my mind but i do want to back up my fridge and freezer and my lights and outlets and that kind of thing so i figured this would help to throw in there as far as trying to quantify you know the amount of power that you want versus the amount of power that you need and uh, you can back up all of the things in your house you know it's quite a bit less expensive to back up only the things that are super important to you you know or, or critical well, are you going to say a word about um, how how these new, new systems allow the um, the solar panels to work with the batteries during daylight hours to increase the power of the of the overall system? Yes. Right on. Yes, I totally am. That's a great. Well, piece. now that you reminded me, I am. <laughs> so this is. Well, uh, so I alluded earlier that if you get in and you are, you know, using your appliances during the day while the sun is shining, that you're not gonna be discharging your battery bank to be doing that. But one of the other things that it gives us is the ability to have more power available than what we could usually just get out of the battery in and of itself, right? Like if you wait until it gets dark outside, you know, your inverter is gonna be pulling power from batteries to run loads. And that's a finite amount of power. The batteries can give this much, the inverter can do this much, that's it. If you're talking about during the day, you have more power than that available because now you've got whatever the inverter and batteries uh, can do, plus whatever solar is bringing in. You know, that's like, a, so if you looked really at an important increase- important feature for, like, for people that want to run their, they live in hot climates, they might want to run their AC and, Air conditioning or HVAC is such a heavy draw, but with the, with a good sized solar array plus the battery system, you could be running your AC some during the day, keeping your house livable and maybe comfortable, um, and then still having stored power for for the nighttime. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really good point, Jeff. The the making hay while the sun shines is is a strong thread through all of this and so the the ability to use power from solar as it's being made is something that we have with both Enphase and with Solark and it's super beneficial to be able to get in and look at not just the amount of power that's stored in the batteries you know that's the amount that we're talking about from when the sun goes down until the sun comes back up that's where your batteries are are going to be used if you're backing up loads right but we're not really talking about during the day so much because mm -hmm. if you're making power from solar then you've got power available right now you know you're charging batteries and you're running loads kind of thing a single end phase in charge three can invert i think like 18 100 watt hours at a time it can do like almost 2000 watts worth of loads on a single in charge three there's 3000 watt hours of power in there that we can use but the inverters allow you to do it 1800 watts at a time right so once it gets dark outside you can pull 1800 watts at a time from your in charge three if you have a bunch of micro inverters on the roof during the day you're going to have that 1800 watts plus whatever you're making from solar, right? If you're making 4,000 watts from solar, then you've got the ability to be doing, you know, 4,000 watts plus the, the 1,800 you could pull out of the batteries. I mean, then you'd be discharging the batteries during the day, which isn't really what you wanna do. The point is that 4,000 watts that you're making from solar, it's there all day long. 
and you could use it. So you could say, well, yeah, sure. During the day, I could pull 4,000 watts, you know, um, as long as the sun is shining. I got 4,000 watts I could be messing around with. Once it gets dark and the solar panels aren't contributing and the micro inverters aren't contributing, now you're just batteries and inverters and you're back to having 1,800 watts available at a time kind of thing. So using power during the day when you've got excess power, that's, that's the key. That's making hay while the sun shines. Good call, Jeff, thanks. Sure. Here's some pricing with Enphase. Single end charge is just under three and a single end charge 10 is just under $9,000. And so if we get in and look at you know, two of the end charge threes for partial home backup is right around 6,000. And three of the end charge tens for the whole home backup example is 26,865. And if we pop back up here, they're pretty darn in line with each other here. The partial home within phase is just under six, and this is just over seven. The E, the e vaults are at 23. Three for two of those, three of the in charge tens are at 26. You know, so they're they're pretty darn close and comparable as far as the price for you know the total amount of capacity that you get. So with all of this in mind, I want to double back onto some of the things that we've gone over to make sure we drive them home. Uh, the batteries. They store a finite amount of power, right? Like batteries are rated for X number of kilowatt hours. And it might be rated in amp hours, but what we know for sure is that there's a given amount of power, you know, in that battery if it's fully charged. We also know that whatever loads we're looking to run, they're going to consume a given amount of power, X amount of power. And so by getting in and looking at what our requirements are, how many watt hours or kilowatt hours per day we need to run our loads, we could then get in and look at battery capacity and have a really solid idea for whether or not it's going to be able to meet our needs. You know, some people will look at, well, I'm able to fit slash afford three of these E-Flex batteries. You know, how much is that going to get me? You know, well, that's 315 amp hours. That's going to be, you know, for a like 13 kilowatt hour of usable power that you have. And then it's and then it's kind of on you, you know, like, you know how much power that is. You have to kind of quantify how much it is by looking at how much you use and what kind of loads you're running. But this is one of these things where, you know, if you give someone a gallon of water and they say, well, how long is this going to last? I don't know. You know, you could chug a gallon of water in an hour and make yourself sick or, or you could survive on it for like two weeks or longer kind of thing. So in looking at, you know, you have a given amount of water in your jug. How quick are you going to drink it? You know, you kind of have to get in and take ownership of your system you know, be the power plant manager, know how much power is in your batteries, and then know how to dole it out, you know, to your to yourself and to your family and to your critical loads and that kind of stuff so that you don't end up running out kind of thing. So a huge amount of consideration needs to be given to, you know, how much stored power is needed and and how much power you're actually looking for. Because somewhere in there is the sweet spot, you know, uh, how much power you need to consume versus how much power you've got available. We just have to line those things up. So, oh, and and I've got this this last note in here is on on inverter sizing because this webinar wasn't about sizing up inverters. It was about looking at battery banks and battery capacity, you know. And this this last little note here is to just kind of keep in mind. When you're looking at all of the different things that you're wanting to run, you know, think about how many of those things could be on at the same time, right? If you're doing one of those load evaluation sheets, you could get in and put stars next to things that could be on all the time. Could the well pump be on at the same time as the microwave? 
could the well pump and the microwave be on at the same time that somebody, you know, is using their hot water heater, you know, or how, how are we going to get in and, and, you know, quantify this and they make load controllers Enphase makes a load controller. Solark makes a load controller. These are things that will, they, they replace your breakers, right? They're, they're breakers that have computers that turn things off at a given time, right? Like you could have your air conditioner on a controlled breaker, a load control breaker, and it would say, hey, if your batteries are ever at 50% or lower, turn this breaker off. Right, and that way you're never using your air conditioner to suck the battery bank all the way down until it's at nothing. You know, you can take control over your loads by saying, you know, well, yeah, I only want these loads on when the batteries are fuller than 70%, you know, that kind of thing. That could be something, you know, extraneous, like a, like a pool pump or something where you're like, yeah, I don't really need this to run. But I mean, if the batteries are full, you know, and the sun is out, you might as well. So you can add some smarts into your loads like that. And then there's some stuff that's kind of not, um, I don't want to say it's not smart, but it's not like that smart technology where it's like, oh yeah, this will communicate with your inverter and tell everything what to do based on battery bank. But something simple like a hot water heater timer, you know, that's, that's super simple, basic, not very expensive. You could get in and say, well, yeah, I turn the hot water heater off with this timer every night at 8 p.m and it turns on the following day at 10 a.m. once I know the sun is already out. And that way the hot water heater not kicking on during the night, Hoover and the battery bank down to nothing. So lots of little tricks and tips on, on how to deploy, you know, the gear and how to use it in a, you know, in a smart way. That's great, Swa. And that, was, and that was it, that was all I had for us today. I think I'm, I'm a couple minutes over, but, I'd be happy to go over any of the questions that may have come in. I, I didn't see them. Were you keeping track? Yeah, I answered one. And and um, folks, if you are interested in um, designing and installing a system for your own home, you know, as you can see from this webinar, um, Schwa covered so much uh, there. We can help you uh, figure out what your system should look like, what its capacity should be let you know how it's going to work for you. So if you do want to uh, get a system for your own home, contact us at Go Green Solar. You'll find us on the web. We're available by phone. Thanks so much, Schwa. And thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Really appreciate it. We'll have another webinar soon on a, on a different topic. It'll be fun. So I hope I can see you all then as well. Stay tuned. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.